So what I'm going to do is uh, give you a different uh, flavor to the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pathogenesis. And our focus is on the mitochondria and how SARS-CoV-2, we think, hijacks mitochondria and, and uh, leads to COVID-19 pathogenesis. Uh, I'm not able to move the slides. Outside the slide? Yeah, I'm not, not able to move the slides. Uh, can you click on the slide once? Oh, okay, got it. Uh, so I have to go back. Uh, whoop. How do I go back? Uh, okay, I got it. Yeah, so what so what I was telling is about the role of mitochondria in COVID-19 uh, pathogenesis. So what we I'm going to show you, and this is the, the overall picture of what I'm going to present you and, and provide you some data and try to convince you that those individuals who have uh, somewhat healthy mitochondria seems to have a uh, uh, low level of COVID-19 severity of the disease. Those who have the little tired mitochondria, as you can see here, seems to have a medium risk. And those who have a high risk, and I'll talk to you about those high risk uh, people who have uh, compromised mitochondria, seems to be much more severe and, and leading to mortality. So the, the, the data I'm going to present to you has been published uh, uh, in two or three papers. Uh, one uh, is on top of the list here, which led to in August last year, which got a lot of attention. Uh, that led to the 21,000 and counting uh, download, uh, but it also brings a lot of competition of the idea of what we are trying to do. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a good good progress. Uh, so that uh, perspective led to the validation of those uh, ideas into the patient population. Uh, that was uh, in collaboration with Saima Ajaz. I'm going to talk about that work as well. And that also got a lot of attention and it was selected as an APS select article. And then recently uh, we continued on it and showed that how long coding RNA uh, might be involved in directly regulating uh, mitochondrial function. So when we talk about mitochondria, we are always thinking that all well, the mitochondria are the ATP producers uh, that, you know, that the main function of mitochondria is uh, producing energy. Uh, and here, what I'm showing you is that uh, uh, is that that uh, there is a constant crosstalk between the mitochondria and the nucleus. So there are seven subunits of the mitochondrial DNA encoded proteins make up the complex one. They get together with 35 subunits, and these 35 subunits are encoded by the nuclear DNA. They they are synthesized in the cytoplasm, then they assemble in the mitochondria to make complex one. Complex two is exclusively uh, nuclear. Uh, and then the complex three, you have one subunit coming out of mitochondrial DNA and complex four, three, and, and uh, complex five, two subunits. And here you have 10 subunits encoded by the nuclear DNA in context of the complex three and complex four and complex five around 14 subunits. So this tells us that, okay, that this is a constant crosstalk. And what has been in the last uh, several years is that We've been thinking about mitochondria as the main uh, producer of ATP, but the things have changed, and uh, things have changed for the for the better. And that the proteomic studies and many of the other studies have uh, uh, have shown that mitochondria contain anywhere close to about 1,500 to 2,000 proteins, which are encoded by the nuclear DNA, and they seem to be involved in various different pathways. You can see here iron metabolism, uh, lipid. Uh, they involve in morphology of the fission and fusion and so forth. This is just saying that they are just then more than the ATP producer of the cell. So uh, in addition, what we find, and some of the things may be relevant to COVID-19 pathogenesis, so there are sex differences uh, in function of mitochondria. So the women seem to do much better. They have a superior influence in mitochondrial respiration uh, compared to men, and that also holds up in the animals as well. So what we want to do is, is uh, rethink the mitochondria 
function, what does it mean, and how it relates to the COVID-19 pathogenesis. So what I'm going to show you is that uh, there is, uh, appears to be, uh, there is secret conversation with mitochondria inside the cells. So the mitochondria talk to each other, mitochondria talk to other organelles. But on top of that, the microbes, uh, whether viruses or bacteria, also talk to mitochondria. And if you look at uh, an overall picture of that, uh, the mitochondria seem to act as fundamental regulator of cell danger response by monitoring and responding to whether viral, bacterial, or environmental exposure. So this concept uh, actually uh, originated from Bob Navier's work and Journal Mitochondrion, and that seems to hold up very well. So if you look at and the recent studies, uh, what uh, turned out to be that, for example, if you take the uh, bacteria Helicobacter, uh, that has a WAC, uh, WAC, a, uh, WAC A protein, and this protein, believe it or not, localizes to the mitochondria and affects the, the uh, fission and fusion of that. So we have the listeria, we have Sigella, Legionella, in, and influenza, and, and so forth. So this is obviously affecting the mitochondrial fission and fusion, which will affect mitochondrial function uh, as well. And if you look at the overall picture, just in one case, what it can do. Uh, so, for example, here, the helicobacter, uh, that, that uh, fission and fusion can result in apoptosis. So here you have the back, back and back uh, 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 protein, and that can lead to apoptosis, and obviously the apoptosis will lead to the, the failure of the organs. So uh, other thing what, what we, we need to realize, which has become uh, very well established, is that the mitochondria seems to work as a hub of antiviral response. So you have... Uh, MAVs, uh, which is the mitochondria associated uh, viral signaling uh, and uh, actually uh, antiviral uh, signaling proteins. And what happened there that they, together with a potential chaperone, which we don't know what, what it is, uh, they get to the mitochondrial membrane and that triggers the whole cascade of events, which can lead to the activator effector proteins and, and getting rid of the uh, viral response. So, I'm going to show you simply, and I know in this uh, uh, symposium, there's a lot of been described about the various different components of the SARS-CoV-2, but the one I want to draw attention to is ACE2 and TM TMPRPSS2, and ACE2 in particular, because there is a connection to ACE2 to mitochondria. And and uh, so what turns out to be that, that uh, in the entry point, appears to be that AC2 may be utilized, although we don't have a direct proof, that AC2, which cleaves the, the NG2 into the NG state in 1 and 7, uh, regulates mitochondrial function. This is the work of others. Uh, also, the knockout mice have the mitochondrial respiration reduce ATP, and if we re-express the AC2, that seems to restore the function. So there's a direct link to the ACE2 and mitochondrial function. Then there's a connection to the, uh, the regulation of the NADPH oxidase. And in fact, uh, in 2012, we showed, our laboratory showed the NADPH oxidase localizes to mitochondria and NADPH oxidase is a key player in producing uh, reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria beside the electron transport chain. So the overall picture is that, it, you know, in, in the context of COVID-2, it's going, it seems to be directed uh, many of the uh, events toward the mitochondria. But more directly, when, when I compare uh, uh, the, the previous literature in the context of COVID-1 here, in the top you're seeing here, and if you look at the here, the COVID-2, uh, what turns out to be in some uh, cases, uh, not all, uh, there's uh, there's some uh, evidence that some of the uh, uh, COVID-1 uh, encoded proteins localize to mitochondria. So, for example, here you have a 3A, 3B, 7A, 7B, uh, sorry, 7A, 8A, and 9B. So these were shown to be directly or indirectly involved in the mitochondrial function, which is encoded by COVID-1. We looked at more deeply and appears to be they have mitochondrial targeting signal. They, they likely go to the inside the mitochondria. And then what they do is what we are analyzing at the moment. Uh, but if we compare the COVID-1 to COVID-2, uh, COVID-1 
uh, two does not have three B. It has the three A. It has the seven A, eight A, and and nine B. And all of these proteins are, you know, we have developed tools uh, to figure out what uh, we can do in terms of asking directly the question individually of these open reading frames and then in combination and all together. So what I'm going to show you is some of the comparative analysis uh, at the sequence level. Uh, what you're looking here at the top is the COVID-1 and then the rest of the uh, COVID-2 here to here, they have different uh, strains. Uh, and what you find that there is hardly any difference between the COVID-1 and COVID-2 uh, in the different, uh, in, in the open reading frame three. Then you look at the 7A, uh, 7B is, is the similar uh, similarity, clearly saying that these are based on the COVID-1 uh, finding is likely that mitochondrial function is, uh, is uh, taken over by these open reading frames. Then you have the ORF uh, open reading frame 8A as well, uh, and the 9B. So recently, what we, when we are doing this analysis uh, 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 with Prash uh, at the Amrita Institute, what we discovered was that the long coding RNA, which is RNA24, seemed to match uh, to the CTNNND629 uh, in, in the, actually in this gene. And what turned out to be, there was a paper recently published that the, this catenin pathway, which is also the, called P1P, uh, on mitochondria by inhibiting the NLRP, which is the inflammation which is induced by mitochondrial uh, pathway uh, in the ventilator-induced lung injury. So this is another aspect we have to uh, continue figure out what it means in terms of the, uh, the pathogenesis. So if you look at overall what I've, I've described to you, uh, and this was something uh, we published uh, last year, so those who are interested can follow it. So there appears to be not just the open reading frame encoded by the, the viral genome, you find that proteins which are uh, like, for example, here, non-structural protein, NSP2, 7, and 8, uh, their interaction have been described, uh, uh, which, lead, uh, which is to, with the mitochondrial proteins. And in some cases, you see this is the complex one. This is the ribosomal biosynthesis. And here you look at the, at the NADA, and, uh, the complex uh, one and the complex four. Uh, and then you have this complex five activities as well with the structural protein. So this is telling us something that these viruses and the viral protein uh, seem to interact directly and indirectly and target their protein into the mitochondria and obviously for, for a good reason. So what we wanted to do is... Uh, Test it uh, and see what we can, what we find in the in the context of of uh, patients. So I set up a collaboration with Saima Ajaz. Uh, I need to uh, acknowledge uh, that we have not met. Uh, this was a LinkedIn collaboration. I was putting things which I always do. I'm pretty active on social media, and I put it out there, and then I got a connection. Uh, with Dr. Ajaz and say, well, you know, we can help you with things uh, you are wanting to do. So we set up a collaboration and then we asked directly a very simple and directed approach. We wanted to look at the mitochondrial respiration with the seahorse analysis in the live blood cells derived from the patients. Uh, and so the, and we had to work with the live blood cells because there were no other way where you can do freeze the blood and ask the, and the mitochondrial function. So what I'm showing you here is that is using the mitochondrial respiration, uh, we, uh, sorry, using the seahorse, we measure the mitochondrial respiration. And the way you can do it is, you know, you can use inhibitors, oligomycin, FCCP, that gives you the ATP production. And then you can use the antimycin A and rotenone, and that gives you the maximal uh, respiration as well. So we measure that in the, uh, PMBCs uh, directly, and what I'm showing you is that mitochondrial respiration uh, data. So here is the, the healthy control. Here is the COVID-19, and we compare that in uh, with patient who had the chest infection. Uh, that was another control, and, and actually the study is published. The cohort is described, uh, so if anybody interested can look at it. So if you look at the basal level respiration, uh, that was low. Uh, ATP linked uh, respiration was also low. And then if you look at the maximal respiration, that's also low and the reserve capacity is, is very, very low. So it's clearly saying that the infected individuals uh, have mitochondrial 
uh, dysfunction. Uh, and then one would think that, okay, if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, what happens to the glycolysis? Because there's a connection, uh, especially working in cancer. We know that the mitochondrial dysfunction can lead to high rate of glycolysis in cancer cells. So we want to know what happens to the glycolysis. So we can use the seahorse again uh, with different uh, 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 inhibitors. So, for example, here you look at the oligomycin and, and 2 oxy deoxy, two deoxy glu uh, glucose. And you can measure the glycolytic uh, capacity, and, and here you can measure the glycolysis and the glycolysis reserve. And then when we looked at uh, the, the glycolysis, what we find here that the, the rate of glycolysis was up. This is the basal uh, rate of glycolysis. And when we stress them, uh, then you see the high rate of glycolysis as well. So there's a direct link, uh, as I just mentioned, the mitochondrial dysfunction uh, and the mitochondrial uh, any, any high rate of glycolysis. So we looked at uh, in a different ways that we can use the inhibitor for glycolysis inhibitor can be uh, bring down the mitochondrial respiration uh, and the answer is yes. So that this is what we use uh, in a UK 5099, uh, clearly showing that they, we can bring down the mitochondrial respiration. So what we thought, okay, let's let's look at the any markers we can identify which can give us the handle on severity of the disease. So IL-6 uh, has been known. Uh, IL-6 uh, uh, is very much involved in the COVID-19 pathogenesis. So we measured the IL-6, IL, uh, and what I'm showing you here is that the COVID-19 patient uh, 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 demonstrate high level of IL-6 in, in the blood. Uh, and, and, and those who died obviously had much more IL-6. Uh, so then we want to know, okay, because we're working on mitochondria, we know the mitochondrial function is, uh, is disrupted. Uh, can we test, uh, the mitokines? So the mitokines are peptides or cytokines, uh, that are produced and secreted by cells in response to mitochondrial stress and which act on other cells or tissue. So there are mitochondrial DNA encoded and my, uh, nuclear encoded. So in the nuclear DNA encoded, uh, we look at the FGF21, uh, which is the fibroblast growth factor. And then you have the growth differentiation factor 15, GDF15, and the mitochondrial DNA uh, encoded uh, humanin. Uh, what we found was that, that the FGF21 uh, seemed to correlate very well uh, with the level of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in the patients. So as I showed you earlier, the uh, the mitochondrial respiration was down. But if you look at here, the FGF21 in the COVID-19 patient uh, blood is way up. And those who died also had very high level of FGF21, clearly saying that this may work as a, as a marker. And then when we look at the, the severity of the disease correlating with the healthy individuals, the, the those who had mild COVID and the, and the severe COVID, there seems to be an increasing amount of FGF21 in the blood of these uh, individuals, uh, saying that, that this may serve as a good marker uh, for measuring the severity of the disease. So what I've shown you, I, what I started, uh, that appears to be that the, the mitochondrial hijacking uh, may increase the risk of COVID-19 severity and death in the mitochondria compromised patients. So here I showed you that while well, those who have a uh, little bit of mitochondria compromise, uh, they will have low risk, medium risk, and high risk. But what about the, that population of people who have severe mitochondrial uh, diseases or mitochondrial problems? So for example, in the inner circle, in the dark green, what you're looking at is the mitochondrial disorder. So this is one in five, 5,000 children born in the United States developed mitochondrial disorders. Uh, and there is a large number of that in India and other part of the world as well. And it's a long story. The, the short is that uh, it needs definition. It needs uh, uh, the standard practice to diagnose the disease. But the, nevertheless, these diseases of the uh, of mitochondrial uh, primary disorders are uh, 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 recognized by three organs uh, dysfunction. So if you have a three organ affected in the prime uh, in organs affected in the individual suspect mitochondrial disease. But then secondarily, you have mitochondrial dysfunction uh, occurring in 
many of these diseases. So you have aging uh, itself, then the diabetes and heart and, and all of that. So we think that this compromised mitochondria is, is playing a key role in the severity of the disease and, and the death. So what turned out to be recently, this uh, paper by Lopez Leon, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they identified more than 50 uh, long-term effects of COVID-19. And if you look at them, the top of that, the 58% people experience fatigue. And mitochondria is involved in the chronic fatigue. Uh, if you don't have energy, well, you don't do well, you are tired. So this is something uh, we are keeping an eye on it and trying to figure out what we can do in terms of uh, reversal of this phenotype. So what I'm thinking is that the, the, the mitochondria may play the protective, restorative or regenerative therapy uh, and uh, uh, role, and we can develop some therapies towards that in terms of ameliorating the symptoms of the disease, if not the disease itself. So it turned out that uh, there was a focused uh, uh, pre-conference uh, 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 organized by the uh, group in England. Uh, the conference was about the mitochondria targeted therapy, but you know, we got the attention uh, where there was a whole session on looking at the decoding of the COVID-2 uh, hijacking of the host mitochondria. And then had led to, uh, actually, uh, let me get to the previous slide. So this has moved. Uh, there are several companies who, who are interested in developing uh, to, uh, agents which can restore mitochondrial function or slow down the progression of disease by targeting mitochondria. And something we are also doing in our, in our laboratory uh, for drug development. And what I want to end up with is that this got NIH attention uh, at the National Institute of Health in the United States. So we are looking at, and this is the conference coming up in this, on December 2nd and 3rd. Uh, this, I'm one of the organizers, and there are multiple NIH institutes. Uh, uh, NIBIB is the, uh, NIBIB, actually also the NASA is involved because it turned out that the cross-species effect uh, a study has shown that uh, astronauts which go to uh, space uh, develop mitochondrial problems. So we got together with NASA and NIH, and and uh, this would be on December second uh, and third. So those who are interested uh, can contact me, and I can follow the link. This is going to be a virtual meeting. So I want to acknowledge the the, the people uh, who uh, did the uh, the work. Uh, Saima Ajaz. Uh, as I mentioned, she was a key player in the patient study. Ganeshwar and, and Prashant uh, helped me with uh, the first paper, and we continue to do some extra work on, on COVID. And Jack Chen in my department helped us with the bioinformatic analysis early on. Uh, so what I want to end up with is the if we can develop a way to protect mitochondria or restore or regenerate, uh, we can get ahead. Uh, in the COVID-19 uh, pathogenesis. And I'll stop.